thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Felipe. Let me message him. I think you have more features on this meet meeting than I'm used to. Um, yeah, so it's a corporate. Activity. It's it's a corporate um, uh, account. On, uh, you know, I started the meeting from, and so it has the enterprise features. Fancy. So there's like a whiteboard. Um, I can start that as well. Hey, Felipe. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm, I'm back. Yeah. So I, I, I was I was just asking what's the purpose of the meeting because I, I didn't understand the title of the video call. Sorry. Did you get cut off at that point? Yes. Sorry, so okay. I, I I started recording and then okay, it I'll, I'll, I'll just me. watch the recording. Don't worry. <laughs> it, it, it popped up a message for me, and then it said, due to a technical problem, uh, one of the people in the hangout will have to be removed to start the recording. Felipe Sanchez, and so I clicked OK, and then it, it booted you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> as I was as I was reading out the message, and so I said it's going to reroute Felipe, and then you like got kicked out. Okay, no worries. So uh, I'm sorry about that. I wasn't expecting that. So uh, anyway, yeah. So um, uh, EQX is is a tool which Evan um and uh team you know mainly Quinn as a web developer uh, developed um a couple of years ago for the development of Merriweather's variable font, which um, involved, I think, well over a dozen different collaborators. And so Joyce, who's worked with uh, Eben and Quinn a lot on Darden Studio projects, uh, which is her company, uh, was was helping uh, as a sort of project manager to coordinate all of that. And so the EQX tool was developed for um, testing the um, the typography. So, you know, Font Bakery is doing technical checks and EQX is doing sort of design checks. So it's in some ways similar to the old Impolari testing page, um, but provides a more structured approach. So, yeah, so Evan, uh, you know, has sort of um, initiated the projects, Quinn's the developer and Joyce is doing, doing the project management. And um, the, the um, purpose of the call today is they're going to give everyone a demo and um uh Marek and denny i think you know should be particularly interested in this for noto because one of the things that we want to start doing this year and you know next year the following years with noto is reviewing their design quality because there's a bit of a mixed bag there and some of the designs are very good but some of them have got a, a lot of mixed feedback from users and so the eqx tool may provide a systematic way of doing quality reviews of typefaces. Okay, so Evan, um, uh, take it away. I guess you can share oh, your screen. Did, and, uh, did Marek show up? I didn't. Um... Uh, no, but we've recorded, so we, we are recording. Oh, oh, so okay. All right, cool. Um, Quinn, do you want to start presenting then? Does that mean we lost Philippe? He no, goes. he's no, he's back. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So I think the plan is I'm gonna I'll share my screen. I'll kind of move us around, and Evan's gonna talk about what's going on. So, um, yeah, this is the the way it starts. And this is all stuff. The thing about the EQX you have to remember is that it's all just HTML really. So if you want it to look different than this, um, look like almost anything, then you can make it that way. Um, and yeah, Quinn is going to log in using our, our fictitious identity. And this this tool runs in a browser. Um, it's not obvious. Oh, I should say too that we're running this locally, not on the live server. So there might be some things that happen um, because it's locally ran. Uh, 
like right now it's compiling each page on load. Um, when in production, you have uh, you use some static assets that can be delivered. Yeah, we, okay. we ran into an unexpected bug two days ago that wouldn't fix in time for the meeting. And so we're running the local one, um, but we're expecting to fix the bug. So in the once you're logged in, then you have a dashboard. And the dashboard shows you projects. And within the projects, you have tests. And within the tests, you have test questions. And that's kind of the, 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 the primary superstructure. Um, so yeah. Let's see. OK. This example project. Right, so we're going to go ahead and open up this one. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to look how you edit the, the questions first. Is that right, Quinn? OK. Um, so once you've got a question that you want to ask, then, um, for instance, the most simple possible Latin-oriented question might be about the spacing of an O. You could ask lots of other questions about an O too, but let's say the question is about spacing. In the case of EQX, you can ask an explicit question. And it's designed to say, let you say yes or no, pass, fail, and then you go on to the next thing. Um, it also, EQX recognizes that sometimes the question itself needs a little explaining potentially, especially if you're not familiar with a given script um, or if the idea is unfamiliar to you. If you read the question, you're like, uh, what? Then uh, you can get some context potentially added as well. In addition to that, and we'll show this later, you can also have a reference image. So if you're looking at something and you're like, um, especially again, if it's not a script that you're used to, and you're like, I think I know what this is, and you look at the reference images that are provided, you can then tell, okay, yeah, the thing I'm looking at matches the reference images, or it doesn't. And so then you can react based on that. So there's a number of different levels of support provided in EQX for each question. So here's an example where you've got like a ton of reference images. And reference images um, can be very big if they need to be. You can click on them and they'll pop up as a modal dialog. So um, Quinn, will you scroll down for a second as well? OK, yeah. So in this view, you can see that the EQX tool knows about the piece of HTML that's um, being presented as the sample. And it knows about it to show what it looks like on the right, but it also knows about the CSS element. So if you've got something there and you want to change something about the sample that you're looking at as a test maker, you can go in and for each CSS element, change what that CSS element um, is invoking or uh, calling into uh, into view in the HTML. Um, and so you've got standard HTML elements like P and H4 and so on. Um, but we've also got a system, and we can talk about this uh, towards the end of the discussion, um, which allows you to um, take a pre-made set of very short, um, uh, in a way, nicknames for a CSS element uh, CSS element um, and apply them. So um, in this case, you see EQX CA4. And these, the ones that are here are all sort of Meriwether specific, and they allowed me to control width and weight and optical size and refer to each of these things se separately um, and quickly um, in a very, very short call. Um, this you know easy sort of easy and quick to type, um, so you can make your own. So it's it's a it's a roll your own CSS kind of system. But what's great is that if you know that the typeface you're you're testing has a specific set of characteristics, you can set a set of uh, very short CSS names for each of the characteristics. Um, yeah, you know it's a it could be italic or anything that's on a variable font axis could take one of these characteristics. And what we're looking at right now is actually a variable font um in the example so it's not relying on static fonts you can you can put a, a variable font into the test if you want and eqx knows the knows the difference and will show you information about the font that you've added so um quinn let's um would it be convenient to show them the uh the way that eqx shows you about the fonts you're using yeah let me let me give a quick overview on on 
what we're talking about for this system. Because I think if we talk about it from like the start to the end, it'll be yeah. Uh, it'll make make a little bit more sense. Can I also yeah. just think, I just want to chime in and say what we're presenting here is the minimum viable product. There is more scope. So if it feels like something might be missing, that could very well be um, that because we just we haven't gotten to it yet. Thanks, Joyce. So um, okay. We were talking about how you've got projects. Inside of projects are tests. Um, there's like two different identities for tests. So there's like a test that someone owns as an owner, and they can like organize multiple members to coordinate it. And then there's like the test as like an individual that you take. Um, these shared tests, these tests that are uh, moderated by someone, they have members attached to them, right? Uh, and when you add members to your project, you can assign uh, that test to more people that are on the platform. You can also upload fonts. So this is what's, uh, what we're seeing when we're dealing with these generated visuals on the test creation side. Um, you can upload variable fonts. You can upload traditional fonts. Uh, there's a little bit of like font info logic that goes into this that's detecting where the boundaries are. Uh, so that it's a little bit easier to use. Once those, um, once you've attached the fonts to the project, then they can be invoked anywhere, which gets us into this EQX visual generator. The idea behind this was to have a simple enough tool to use in order to generate visuals for your EQS, EQX projects that are reusable. Because the idea is, hey, you complete one test, you get your results from it, you're probably going to go back, make adjustments, and then want to retest it so that you can see that there's progress, right? But if every time you do that, you need to create a whole new set of visuals, I mean, then we're not really saving anyone time. So the idea was that these visuals are going to be auto-assigned the new font definitions each time. And that way, you have the same context, but you have the updated font file. And then you can track the progress as you go. Um, the other thing, too, is that as part of the uh, agreement with Dave, uh, I promised to make quite a lot of tests. And I may be a third of the way into it now. But what happened as I was making the tests is I realized that the process uh, that we had in place for uh, making them was just horribly inefficient. Um, and I was bothering Quinn all the time saying, will this work? How was this? You know, what about this? And eventually Quinn kind of threw me uh, a life ring um, and made this generation tool. And so what I can do is make the content in quite a simple way um, that doesn't have a lot of the um, kind of the, the, the part of the HTML that I don't care about as a test maker. Uh, not included, and then it gets included for me as part of a build process. And so um, a lot of things that could get like uh, futzy and messy if they weren't automated are now automated as part of the build tool. So it's actually this incredible, nice, kind thing that Quinn did for me uh, so that I could make the, the tests in an efficient way by making this you know extra tool that kind of feeds content into EQX. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I think I'll end my my spiel for context here, Evan. After this, uh, but we were talking about these individual classes, these instances where we're defining the font instances. We needed a, a non, um, like we needed a solution for that that wasn't based off the font tables. So we've created the file called EQX defaults that assigns all the different instances so that you can quickly assign them or search for them within the style definitions. And then, so you just have one file on an EQX generator that you basically make all the definitions. So this is for Meriwether. And then it adds that to all of the images that you're including in the project. Um, so, so do you want to do you want to zoom in and explain kind of what the relationship of the um, the very short code is to the CSS values? 
because uh, yeah. I kind of I know what's in there because I've played with it, but it's a little <laughs> hard to see even for me on a big monitor. Oh yeah. Um, okay. So basically, the way that this is working is we have class definitions that happen. We're using these in order to assign specific uh, groupings of text within the HTML that's being generated. Uh, a, a, some type of like Merriweather or, or general font uh, variable feature definition. And so it begins with the class name and then the variable settings. And so, you know, this is extensible, extendable as far as you want it to be. Um, and then you basically just reuse those classes in your HTML. I can show you what that kind of looks like, but the idea is that it should be flexible enough for anyone who has, you know, really uh, rudimentary HTML background. And basically what happens is we have a little gulp script. It combines your CSS, your examples, your header and footer, your default.js, which is where we were uh, making all those variable font definitions into a file that's output in the dist. And I don't think we, we only have one little example in here, but Eben has a whole package of his own where you basically just make some HTML. If you're curious on how Eben is doing this himself, because his fork is a little bit more built out, uh, you can check that out. And his naming convention is a little bit different, but he has a whole series of visuals here that we're using for these tests. So we'll we'll go ahead and show you some of those visuals. And what we're going to show you today is um, a little bit Noto oriented, but is ultimately oriented towards showing the the range of things that are possible, um, because there's a number of different kinds of things you might want to. Uh, use EQX to worry about, you might want to worry about just text things, um, or you might really be making a display font and you want to know what does my display font look like when it's on a bag of chips or something. Um, and so EQX is trying to be agnostic about scripts and is trying to be agnostic about typography as well. Um, so if you can make something by way of a test um, that's in HTML, then you can test that in EQX. And I'll pull up the actual tests that we're seeing so that we can see them side by side from the questions that we're creating. So this is what it looks like on the front end when you're actually answering these tests. So let's go ahead and say yes, and then go to the next question. I've already pre-answered a few of these. Uh, okay. I ha but not not all of them. <laughs> okay. So it, that's why sometimes you'll see things that already exist. <laughs> right. So then um, I think that this is too tight. So let's say no. And you, uh, yeah, you can you can create a comment. And this, actually, this this part is maybe one of the most important parts because. Um, you're going to say no, but it's not enough to say no. You need to say why you're saying no. And you can also react uh, to other people's comments, I think, in this. It's all, uh, right now, it's only allowing you, uh, members that are attached to that project to react and to answer. So um, that might be something we want to change in the future, but for now, it makes sense. May I, may I make a question about this? Sure. Um, so in the workflow for a pull request on GitHub, if someone makes a comment on a snippet of code in, in that pull request, and then someone else pushes a new commit addressing the issue, then the user interface has a way to say, this is an outdated comment that was addressed, and you can dismiss all older conversations. So is there anything in that, that kind of workflow for once you change the font files, can you can you go back and see the old comments and say, oh, this was addressed, this was not yet addressed, and so on? The, oh. 
I, I was going to say I don't I don't think we've got a mechanism for that. It's mostly a question of catching what's wrong and then providing that back to the developers so that they can kind of keep going. And it's a, the idea is that if you're making a font, the number of things that can go wrong is, you know, in the, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands or something. And keeping track of it is tricky. And so the idea is that if you can have a filter, catch things that are wrong, you go back and you address them, then you test them again and see if it, if it works. Um, but you bring up a good point. Um, I have to have a chat with Quinn and see what he thinks about it. Can I say, I might be wrong, but I think I understand a little bit where there might be a disconnect between, um, I have flipped away from the screen, so I didn't hear who asked the question, but um, was that Philippe? Um, yeah. Between Philippe and Eben. Um, I think, Philippe, there isn't really a thread. So you, you're you kind of assuming the way other interfaces handle things, that there's a thread of conversation um, you know, sort of like if we were, if you and I were working together on a Google Doc, that's not how this functions. Each in each instance of running the font through a test is acting like it's a fresh thing. It's keeping track of progress by a percentage of um, pass and fail, um, but it's um, it's not. It's acting completely anew each time, you know, is the spacing around the O working? Um, because, and I think that we talked about this early on, and I think that there really is a reason why it's better to confront each thing anew like that, because in the construction of a font, new problems can appear that hadn't been there, or problems can just disappear when you don't, you know, you hadn't gotten to them yet, but like just something, you know, so it, it's better to just, and then the other thing is the, the grade, the percentage, you can have an internal um, determination for each individual type of test, what percentage actually constitutes good enough. You know, we, it, it, when we're making fonts um, as a, you know, the, this team works on other pro kinds of projects as well. And when we're making fonts, we always talk about, you know, the last 15% can take, you know, 120% of the time of the rest of it, if you let it. So you could decide that when you hit 85%, you have passed. Or you could decide, no, we need like crazy legibility on this font. And we really are pushing for 80, 95% here or, or whatever. So, so it, it, it has a, um, um, a sort of goldfish memory a way that the tests are are working in order to to allow you to have that internal control. But I think one of the things that, that Felipe's question brings up, which I think is interesting, it's not really in scope for the project, but is interesting, is um, the idea that you know maybe uh, it would be possible at some point in the future for EQX to kind of collect all of the nodes and just make a new set of tests built off of those nodes, um, something like that. So there was like a little bit of a connection, even if the specific comment wasn't threaded or in other words, there's, there's levels to creating continuity. There's levels of automation that we could add to this um, yeah, that, in the future. That's um, something that we've been talking about. Uh, we'd really like to add into the platform is like generating a more optimized test post completion. I, I do want to say though, I think we're we kind of uh, okay. We're, we're kind of wrong with keeping track of these threads. So each question has comments. Those comments have replies. They're all individual threads, and they're attached to the questions. At the end, well, I guess at any time because it auto saves. Um, that test retains all of the data that was inputted for uh, everyone who was participating in it. And you can actually download that data um, as a JSON. What then happens is that you update the test, it changes the version of it, and then all of that data still stays there as a test that you can refer to back later. So if you want to go back and be like, okay, what were the comments from test version 1.1? You could, but yes, like uh, Joyce was saying, on version 1.2, those comments will be hidden because it is essentially 
uh, a clean slate. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply you couldn't go back and look at prior tests. I'm sorry if I made it sound like that. Excuse me, Bear. Hello, this is Adam. May I ask briefly a question just to understand the... So, let's say a particular... So, I understand a test is, well, this set of questions with the corresponding assets, etc. And also is a particular version of the font files or how, how is, how are the fonts or particular versions of fonts related to this question? So if I update the fonts, uh, do I like, is this a new test or is this like a so new version of the same test? Yeah. So they're not, you know, you can update the test and not the font files. And that's not going to change the version of the test unless you actually uh, ask it to change its version. But every time you update the font file, um, right now it just generates a new version number. There might be some type of mechanism we want to add in that like confirms that. But the idea is if the font files change, it should have the new version number. That way we can keep track of progress. Okay, excellent. And may but, I but there is a there okay. is some manual. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to do manually, both in terms of creating tests and sort of uh, being intelligent about what you include and why. Um, and also the naming of tests at this point will be a lot like the naming of fonts, where you know you need to like put a date on it or a version number or something else. Um, we don't have a, a mechanism that sort of makes that part of it easy for you yet. Um, and again, whether that's that's something that should be added is something that we could talk about. Um, but yeah, we didn't take that on as part of our remit yet. Um, but you you bring up a really good point, Adam. Um, may I just briefly? I'm I'm sorry, I don't want to like, but but I'm trying to. Maybe you can address it at a later point. But uh, you know, HTML, you can basically, well, especially this is relevant for Noto. So like for Noto, we have these linguistic modules, let's say you have Noto Sans Armenian, it only has the Armenian letters, right. but then digits and punctuation, you would need to see how they perhaps uh, render from Noto Sans, the non-Armenian ones. So basically I'm asking about fallback and combining, you know, several font files to um be kind of treated as a font or you know interaction of glyphs between two font files you know how that does it look let me repeat back to you what i think i understood you to be saying um so if you've got uh, a version of uh noto and it's version nine and you're going to be doing 10 you want to kind of compare the two it sounds like you're asking um, like yeah no not really i i was asking mostly you know a font from the CSS perspective, can be basically a CSS font stack with fallbacks. So when somebody is using Noto Sans Armenian, they also need to include Noto Sans because that has digits and punctuation, which Noto Sans Armenian oh, does. Oh, I see, and I effectively see. Effectively, you get presented a, you know, the CSS font is effectively a union uh, of those two. So the so two resources. The, yeah. Yes. And whether this is something that, you know, is like when I upload some font files and then I enter text which uh, uses characters that are not necessarily in the first or whatever font. Right. What happens there? Then? I think, I, I mean, Quinn, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that if you if you create your CSS in such a way that you call the first font uh, first and then you have your next font as the kind of your next fallback, like you know, we used to do for Verdana and then Sans Serif, you know, uh, then it should work, I think, because that's quite old technology and should be just built in because it's a browser and it's CSS. Quinn, is that wrong? Uh, it, it's correct, but there is a concern that happens when you do that, which is that we are trying to guarantee that the font files that are displaying are the ones that you're trying to test for. So Normally, we recommend that you don't include any font definitions in the HTML files included in the page. That way, you can be you know, assured that you're not displaying a font file that's unexpected. Um, I could see an argument for maybe 
making a, a connection in the generator to maybe a GitHub repo or something that has a clear distinction for like, hey, this is this font file, this is its font files fallback. That way it's always going to be in sync with that GitHub repo. But it would just uh, it would just take a little bit of thinking and implementation. Does that answer your okay, question, thanks. Adam? Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Cool. So um, the thing that we're looking at now is um, we've gone from asking questions about individual letters to a uh, paragraph, and in this case, actually, my sample and the question don't match. So that's sort of a little embarrassing because I thought the the part after Eli and Max underneath the the headline plum and cilantro, I thought that paragraph was going to be in italic. Um, but I was wrong about that. So imagine that's italic, though. Um, the question is, are the italics comfortable and pleasing to read in a paragraph? And so what we're asking about is the character of the italic, not a particular letter within the italic or the spacing of a letter or any other characteristic of a letter. We're asking about a paragraph. And so um, that is something that we're trying to use EQX uh, to do so that we're looking at uh, letter level uh, word level, paragraph level questions, and then pushing out into even larger typographic concepts. Because anything that you can uh, show in HTML is a, is a question that you can ask. And so part of the point of this deck is to show that, yeah, um, that that's the case um, with examples. Um, so let's say yes or no, I guess, and go to the next question. Right, so here we have like a poster. And so um, one of the things that will happen is if you make a typeface that's really great for text, it might be a little too dull for a poster. So in this case, uh, Quinn has added the display version of uh, Meriwether, which is hopefully eye-catching enough for the poster. You, you be the judge about whether it's effective or not. Um, and then um, let's go to the next thing. So you can use SVGs to uh, give yourself uh, gradients and color and other things so that you can kind of create a richer, like more visually intense set of tests if you want, if that's relevant to your design, or if you were doing a color uh, font, then you, know, you could also um, include color. Um, but the idea that everything has to be black and white in your font testing, if you're using web pages, it kind of goes away. Um, and I think that's a kind of wonderful thing. Um, so that's why I made this, just to prove that particular point. Um, let's go to the next thing. So yeah, this, this is a kid's game, and I grabbed the background illustration um, because one of the things that you might want to figure out is, um, especially if you're making a font for um, some client somewhere, and you know what the body of illustration um, is like, um, you might want to take your font and inject it into backgrounds that have that kind of aesthetic uh, quality. And you can see what the interaction is between an illustration style and the font that you're using. Um, and that's not something that you know you worry about if you're making kind of a, a text face um, that's meant to be used in, in lots of different situations. but. Um, EQX is meant to be a tool that allows you to do, you know, highly specific uh, things, and not isn't just for um, making, you know, um, generic text fonts or something. Um, it's good for all kinds of different uh, typeface design. And <clears throat> at the other end of the scale, if you're trying to make things that are really elegant then you might ask yourself a question like, does this look good on the back of a perfume bottle? Um, you know. So in the case of the, of the, the children's uh, game, I think Meriwether isn't a particularly good fit. I think here it's a little bit better fit. Um, but it just shows you the power of putting your typeface next to uh, something which has a strong uh, cultural flavor, a strong cultural context. Um, and so yeah, you can, you can do that. Um, with EQX, and I think that's a really great thing. I'm excited to use it in that way. Um, and then the other thing that I think maybe the the most wonderful thing is that we have for EQX uh, now 
um, is that you can scrape a web page. And it's, I think it, it'll be interesting to talk to Quinn after we're done about um, what kinds of web pages maybe don't scrape as well as others. Um, but the fact that you can scrape a web page means that if there's a piece of typography that um, really illustrates a use that you're interested in, if you you know want to have a typeface which is you know fantastic for a newspaper, go grab a couple of newspaper pages and inject your font into it. And as with uh, the previous example, you don't have to just um, change everything because you can use something like um, the, the font injectors that uh, that Stephen Nixon made, um, and there are others, um, you can um, you know just choose the piece that you want. So if you're only interested in headlines in a news context, you can just change the headlines, or you only want the body copy, you just change the body copy. And so being able to grab somebody else's typography saves an incredible amount of time if you want to test a font in a particular structure. The other thing, too, is if you want to have real text you know you could just go into a web page and grab the text out of it and chuck it into your indesign file whatever you're using to test um, but if you can scrape a web page that has that uh, text then you can get not only the text itself but you can get the context in which it's seen um, and i think that there's there's extra value in that and i think yeah clearly um some kinds of web pages are more useful than others, but yeah, this doesn't try to tell you about that. It just gives you the capability of choosing the things that you find uh, give, you know, offer real utility in testing. I think this is really wonderful. And basically I could imagine, you know, people making, because it's a web page, but of course, you know, we could make another group who may not necessarily be so familiar with this tool can just make some, you know, we could take existing test pages made in HTML for particular fonts that are already out there, you know, what yeah, or yeah. whatever, the, the, those components that other people have made and use the scraping, but sort of save ourselves a lot of time of rebuilding this in this particular, like in, 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 uh, in Equix or EQX. Um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should have named it differently. Um, yeah, no, it's true. You could grab other things. I mean, the downside to add, like going and getting, um, you know, some of the tools that exist is that they, in general, don't have explicit questions tied to explicit pieces. So I would probably encourage you to take those existing tests and kind of cut them up into little pieces and drop them in with explicit questions so you can yep, track what's I, going I, on. I agree. But, yes, but, but, you're, but you're right that you could certainly, uh, you could grab them wholesale um, and it would work. So over here, Quinn is showing um, that you can open up this side thing and you can go find your questions um, and find the ones that you want. Um, we should probably look at a results page um, and kind of show what it's like when you've got um, some results. We're still doing Q and A, so sometimes we get things we've missed, like not rounding up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so this is a results page. The idea here is it's not dependent on having a completed uh, series of members uh, of all of their questions before you can actually get meaningful results. So it takes averages, it uses the answers that you've already given to create a grade which is basically like of the questions that have been answered, uh, is it pass or fail? And then it gives you an understanding of like, hey, you know, 12 answers in total have been submitted, all of which happen to be from me, um, eight of which passed. There are two people on this project. So even if I completed all of the questions, I would only get up to 50% done of that project for progress. 
but I would still get, if I were to answer correctly on all of them, I would still get a grade of 100%. And then you basically have a breakdown of like, hey, what questions uh, are here? Which ones have been answered? How completely have they been answered by each member? And what are their individual scores? If they haven't been answered at all, well, then they don't have an individual score because we don't know if it's positive or negative. And like I was saying beforehand, you can hit download. This outputs a JSON file that gives you information on who the members are, what the tests are, uh, everything associated with them, all of the responses, all of the replies. Um, I keep saying like comments and replies because the idea is that it's like it's a little bit atomic, right? So it's like you have a comment and then you have replies that are attached to that comment. It's all a relational re relational database, and you can kind of see an overview of these results if you go to the home page, or at least to the dashboard. So if you were to go to Yeah, if we were to go to this test, you know, you can hit members. Um, oh, I think it hasn't loaded yet. There we are. There it goes. The mark of the beast shows up. I know, eh? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> um, and then you can, like, see uh, different members' progress, right? So, like, test user is our second member. But they haven't completed anything. The schmucks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the example user uh, is about 67% done, all the questions. And then where else are we? Oh, uh, there's an import and export. This is a feature we're still working on. But the idea for the import and export uh, is it isn't uh, just for results. It's so that you can actually import and export a whole test. So if you were to create a test in maybe a local machine or on some other EQX server, because the idea is that you, know, you can run EQX on your own server, you can run it locally, um, it can be used as an as a independent designer, but it can also be used as an uh, organization, right? Where you've got a whole group of team members that are collaborating on the Q&A of one uh, project. And the idea is, hey, I export this test, I go to my local server, I go to uh, another organization, maybe I'm in the exact same organization, but it's a different test, and I can import it again. And then that way you don't need to create that test from scratch and copy from a CSV or something. It's just one button. May I suggest in the report, uh that there could be some sort of highlighting of the replies that are not uh, agreed upon. Like right, uh, that, that, the there's some disagreement. Ones. Like uh, some people said yes, some people said no. So you want to highlight what, what is not well established as a yes or a no, right? Yeah, excellent. That would be uh, particularly relevant for a no-to thing, I think. Yeah, because you have little organization, one person decides. But if it's a big organization, not so much. Um, if I just wanted because so my understanding is that basically right now one could create like upload the assets, the create the questions manually, but then there would be some way with this import function to also create these tests, especially the assets programmatically, right? Because well, I'm thinking. The particular use case and you know the thing that i've been testing a lot was using you know browser shots and a particular font and then kind of seeing rendering uh, as it would render on android or on uh, ver version uh, different versions of windows uh because of the hinting obviously which is you know it's always a bit tedious to do to deal with like virtual machines and it's kind of and of course, with stuff like browser shots, you can script that, so you can you can you can make you know you can take your font, you can uh, sort of make a website, get browser shots or a similar service to 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 make these screenshots on different browsers and virtual environments, and then grab them back, and then you can create this test and say, well, you know, do you you know do does this look fine? Does this look fine? Does this look fine? 
Right, it might be the same question every time or almost, um, but for 20 different browser shots or whatever it is. Exactly, and maybe yeah. you know different strings, uh, etc. But made as an asset because, of course, you know, I, I, I well, I mean, HTML rendering is great, and I, I, I really love it, how it, you know, how it, how it seems to be working. Um, but also, I know that, well, from my perspective, I usually spend quite, you know, quite some time on checking the screen quality on some other systems because that's where often you know things are you know make people unhappy it's like and right also, you know ah this stuff doesn't look good on windows xp and then yeah i mean you you make a good problem. point because the the this is sort of assuming a northern wealthy typographic reproduction you know uh uh, view rather than uh, you know uh, a cheap Android from from five years ago or whatever it would be, um, and so it I think what you probably have to do is to write a little script that takes the output from your browser shots, and um, you know drop it would maybe take um, the output for the browser shot for a particular question, name the folder the name of the question, and then like have your script process that into. Um, partially yeah, made, yeah, that's something, yeah that's par something partially exactly made HTML, thinking, yeah. and then you could you could use the build script that we've got um, to sort of do the rest uh, for you. Um, so I think, yeah, mm -hmm. it would be. I mean, the, the process of building would be a little bit more manual, a little bit more tedious than you probably strictly like, but would still save you time. Um, I can just also say on this what Adam's talking about in our GF Tools repository, we have a um, tool called Gen HTML that uses browser stack and allows you to write custom HTML templates. And it has a daemon mm -hmm. server. So you can run from the command line your own HTML test page. And then you can specify which browsers you want browser stack to take screenshots of. And it can do you before and afters as well. So you can provide fonts that came before and fonts afterwards. Very nice. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we don't use that for design. That's simply just for looking for regressions between releases. But you can do proofs, but it's not as sophisticated as the examples I'm seeing here. I mean, in theory, you could use a, a more visually sophisticated example if that if it was relevant. Um, but I, I imagine that basic rendering for text sizes is something which might look boring or you know non entertaining um, if it's going to be really efficient. Um, did we, Quinn, did we uh, cover everything? Have we skipped over anything that was important that we wanted to touch on? We I might want to just show that there is a, you know, a headless CMS behind all of this for, for moderation. So, you know, the idea is um, we're trying to make a platform that's flexible. And Yes, some people will visit it, and they'll want to be using EQX and the tests that have been already created for it for their own projects. Maybe they're an independent foundry. Maybe they only have you know, one tech designer or one QA, and they'll be using this locally. Or perhaps we'll have a, a platform somewhere that's hosted for uh, general consumption. The other side is that a company comes along. They want to supply this as a centralized uh, testing environment for 20 of their employees. They'll take EQX, they'll set it up, it's all on Docker, um, you know, stick it on, uh, on a server somewhere and run it, and then they can kind of have control of how to deal with it. Um, that control, yes, could just be you know, further development or making changes to the code, but there's also another layer that we've created which is the um, the strappy based admin. So this is the headless CMS that powers like all the data models and uh, uh, user authentication and all that fun stuff. And so whoever the admin is, maybe that is the developer who set up the platform. Maybe that is a project manager that has their own login. I mean, it can be as many logins, as many people you want to access it as you'd like. 
uh, you then have this environment where you can see an overview of every answer that's been submitted, every user, every organization, every comment. Um, and then you basically have admin level moderation where it's not like going through your database to find something or to make sure to remove something or, or whatever. Um, or maybe it's, you know, I don't want my fonts to be on this anymore because there are some NDA concerns. Essentially, it just gives you the power as an admin uh, in a nice GUI that allows you to make any changes necessary. The other thing about the scraper I just remembered is that we had a bug where we couldn't do an M dash. So that was not ideal. And so, yeah, there's like there's little things that we're trying to make better still. And I might try to convince Quinn to use a new color instead of purple. I'm not sure. It's all material UI. So <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, I just got to rename one word that's purple to any color you want. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 other, the other thing that hasn't been said, but it's, um, and I've, I've said in the recording uh, that we did for Type Weekend, is that um, when you're asking questions, it, it, this is maybe teaching your grandmother to suck eggs. It's a sort of obvious thing to say. But if you're designing you know, um, uh, optical sizes or a sans versus a serif or so on, um, all the different kinds of uh, testing that you might do are going to be always very project specific. And so the idea is that I'm going to try to provide you with a range of examples that kind of shows you um, what's possible and as much as I've been able to imagine kind of the, the length and breadth and height of what you could do with EQX. Um, and I'm using Meriwether as kind of my my touchstone uh, for doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to show the way in which you can make a set of uh, test questions which is specific to a particular kind of design. Um, so you know, if, if Meriwether wasn't a serif design, it was a, a sans design, or if Meriwether uh, wasn't uh, a serif design and it was. Um, like some sort of fantasy font, um, then the kinds of questions that you would ask, the things that would be relevant to it would be completely different. Um, and so that's why EQX is set up in such a way that you you were ask all of your own questions. Um, the other thing too is that um, I'm really hoping EQX will get used like um, we're talking about potentially using it for Noto so that um, different scripts are served. And so the the kinds of questions um, that you would ask about Thai, you know, you need a Thai expert to ask those kinds of questions, and um, yeah, it 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 leaves the the door open to using EQX in a lot of different ways. Hey, Bug, that's a really nice bow and arrow, Bug. Um, but I'm I in a meeting right now. Can you go back up, please? Um, I'm I'm gonna go get I'm gonna go brush my teeth. Okay. Uh, um. Okay. So. I think we have to wait a little bit. <laughs> I, I have a question about, uh, but but I, I, I want Evan to reply to the question. Um, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go brush my teeth. <laughs> uh, so, um, I understand what you're saying, and it relates to one thing I, I wanted to ask, uh, which is um, in, in the Font Bakery workflow, we have this approach of having these collections of checks that are pre-existing and then can, can be reused for many, many different font projects. And some of them are vendor specific where where it only applies to one organization and some others are more universal and we keep them in the universal profile. Of, right. Um, and, and I understand that there's many, many, many project specific questions you can create on, on this platform. But at the same time, I would expect to see some basic things that any form project would have to evaluate. So yeah. it would still make sense to have something similar to Font Bakery in terms of having like a collection of pre-existing checks or, or categories of pre-existing checks based on the type of project you're working on, right? 
the, the, oh, for instance, you, I you, mean, you could, I, I mean, you could make before, them and save them, export the JSON files, and save yeah. that on a repository as a ready-made collection, right? Right. I mean, the the set that I'm making uh, for Meriwether is meant to sort of offer some part of that, um, because um, yeah, some even though it's a serif, a lot of that stuff could be you know adapted to a sans serif. But if you think about um, another script like Thai, of course, nothing will be relevant. And um, if you think about a different way of writing, say black letter or uh, you know old English style connected script, um, you know Bickham script type of thing. Um, all of a sudden, the questions you're asking about some of the letters will sort of not be relevant anymore. So um, even though I'd love for there to be like a really huge corpus of things that are like constantly relevant, I think the reality in type design is that the size of the constancy is smaller than we'd like. Um, but there will be template tasks that, you know, that you could make for yourself or that I, I we're hoping we'll have a community of people using EQX and you know you could say like this looks really close I'm going to grab this and edit it rather than starting from scratch like exactly that, that sort of thing will exist but that's not coming from us it's not going to be built in to EQS, EQX we're we've made the platform not oh there there are going to be some sample tests but they're all actually kind of intended to orient people more than provide the actual full tools. The other thing too, is that I think that if you're doing a set of tests, which are, uh, let's say, serif specific, you can, in a way, remove all the serif specific stuff. And a lot of what's left over is relevant to a sense, let's say. Um, but I think if you're, if you're being quite a thorough, careful user of EQX, if you're making, let's say, a geometric, or you're making a grotesque, your tests should not really be identical. And will they be mostly identical? Yes, but there should be differences um, if you're doing a good job. There could um, also still, I imagine that, I mean, my understanding is that, you know, that, that for a particular font, one could make like three projects and in one project, there could be the general kind of template-based questions. In another project, there could be of uh, the sort grotesque of, specific uh, or geometric specific, specific questions. Yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Then, I don't know, screen rendering stuff could be in a third project and that could, um, that could be like, yeah, based on, on, on some other technology and also created in a different way. Like some, some tests could be made out of some tool versus other tests would be kind of manually curated, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And then the thing that we were saying in Tokyo, which we haven't said today, is still true, which is that um, you can take all the material that's generated from this and stick it off in a server somewhere. Um, and uh, as long as an EMP doesn't come along and destroy all known data for all people, then you should be able to go back in 10 years and see like what was going on with that project then mm -hmm. and what were the comments that people made um, and get a good idea of Kind of what was going on, so it's a it's a good way of keeping uh, records for uh, future extensions of a given type project, um, instead of it being sort of a situation where you're sort of guessing quite a lot about what the decision making process was like for a given font. But I think it's really important to say that, like, if your workflow, Philippe, is that you really want to have like the same tests for the same things you have control over what your EQX build is like, and that is a thing that you can do. But I am hoping that when I'm done with the, the Meriwether uh, test questions that you'll have um, a fairly substantial uh, jumping off point that you know many of the things that you would naturally want and would be sort of relevant for almost for the majority of cases, because mostly people make texty sans serifs or texty serif fonts, that <laughs> you'll you'll be significantly catered to uh, going out, and you only have to do a bit of adaption uh, to make it uh, completely relevant to a particular typeface uh, project. We've been imagining an endless amount of extensions to this thing, right? Uh, the reality is we just can't build them all, but. Uh, if we're talking about 
creating these tests and having uh, modular implementations on them that you can call. One of the things that we'd really like to see would be some type of repository that has sanctioned uh, categories of tests, kind of like how Robofont or Glyphs had uh, a, a platform of plugins that were sanctioned in some sense. And then you could request in EQX to just call down and import into your test without having to separately go to that GitHub repository and grab it. And then you can kind of uh, avoid all of the possible debugging issues that might come along with that because we've already guaranteed that, hey, this test works for implementation and for importation. It's already on the platform and you have a series of ones that you can pick. Some questions are also going to be uh, script specific and will also be generalizable. Like um, I wrote one for uh, for this meeting for the D with a vertical, a vertical Karen or vertical Karen oriented questions. Um, because best practices with uh, a D with a vertical Karen is to leave enough space um, so that uh, you kern your way out of what's ugly instead of having uh, letters with ascenders crash into the vertical Karen. And that's actually one of the ones where I, I provided um, a sample. Um, and that's that's an example of something which is not um, design specific, but is sort of a language or script specific. I had this question, maybe it's a bit basic, but can a single question have multiple answers, given you, you are working in a team? and you will have many members, but from what I say, see in the kind of demo you made, you have only one answer and then you hit next question. But what happens if another member of the same team thinks differently, thinks that the question for that will be no, for example. Would you have different answers for the same, for a similar question? For the same right, if, if you've got, a, you could have, I mean, hypothetically, you get a hundred people come through, and uh, you know, eighty percent of them say, "Yeah, that looks fine to me," but the other twenty percent say, "No." Um, the system will track um, all of those no's, and it will track all of the reasons that they give for saying no. This is not a pass. Yeah, Absolutely. there is. Uh, we are being very opinionated with how that uh, answer process is done. And the intention there is to be like, hey, if you say yes, there's no point for a comment. Uh, we, you know, we, we're not trying to create friction here. If there's a comment or some sort of distinction that you want to call out, then that answer is not yes. The answer is no. And we need to revisit it and we draw attention to it. So that's why only on no can you then participate in commenting. Um, only on no does the grade go down. And does it start drawing attention from the results? Um, because the idea is we're trying to break these questions, these tests into questions that are small enough bite sizes that we can uh, start to meaningfully automate the QA uh, process and see like, hey, where are their real issues? OK, but for that, yes, it should be the questions <laughs> has to be really strategic to not be too broad for example like yeah yeah you, you, have have to, you have to write you have to write the question in a really clear way and i think for what i found is that if i'm looking at a piece of typography i've set up to test something i can often ask myself you know uh anywhere between you know two and ten questions about that that piece of typography so um and the, you know, what I found was that mentally keeping track of all of those questions for that given piece of typography is like a bit of a heavy lift. And so EQX is meant to, you know, take on that burden for me and remind me, okay, remind me not to forget, you know, maybe I remember three of the five and I forget the other two. That's not good. So if I can just write them all down, then it's a bit like taking a, um, a list to the grocery store and that way you don't forget that you needed salt or whatever it was. We're, yeah. we're placing a responsibility on the test creator in order to make thorough 
and specific questions so that we can move away from the ambiguity that uh, most conventional typography QA has to participate in. But also, if you're someone like Adam, then you can make a bunch of EQX tests, and then you can say, um, yeah, um, I'll uh, make sure that your Polish uh, text support is really solid. Um, here's my test. And you can either license those questions from Adam, or um, maybe he'll kindly provide them to you, and you can use them in EQX, or whatever the, the situation is. But the, the idea is that you can take advantage of an expert. You can ask them to write questions for you um, and uh, get a more thorough uh, set of tests built up. Yeah, and the scenario I can imagine where you would be most likely to have like most multiple test takers, what you described, Viviana, where you've got multiple test takers and they don't agree, is actually a language expansion. So the art director might take the test initially, um, and you know, so when we when we do a language expansion, we usually have a language expert, an art director, and then a consultant who comes in with fresh eyes when it's mostly done. So the art director might take the test and pass a bunch of things. And usually the consultant finds, you know, under 10 things that we missed because, you know, our eyes weren't fresh. That's the whole point of them. And, and so you as the administrator watching the test is going to wait, you're going to wait those no's coming in from that specific user. You'll just wait them more highly in your head. You're like, oh, okay, we need to look at these no's. Does that make that does that make sense? So all not only the questions are going to be uh target with the user that made them, but also the answers. So you can pick all the answers from one user to pay more more attention to that but to that list of questions of answers from that user. I don't, I don't think that's exactly true, but you would see the no's. Quinn, do you want to explain that? Yeah, it, unfortunately, we do not have the ability to do that right now, but that is, uh, that's something that would be awesome, and it's very clear that that would be very helpful. Yeah. So something of filtering where we can see specific users and how they participated, uh, maybe that's something that we can add to the roadmap, because I can, I can see how valuable that is already. Yeah. I, I have a question, please. Um, how I, I, I missed how the the imagery, the sample images uh, uh, that you're supposed to compare against, or not actually the, to compare against, but the actual font images are getting created. Uh, so the question is, how dynamic um, is the creation of the tests? The the reason I'm asking is just today I was QAing a, a font family. And it had um, one completely misdrawn uh, weight out of five weights. And so my question is, can like how how easy is it to take, for instance, uh, uh, weights of a typeface uh, into consideration when creating these tests? Because if you scroll, if you scroll forward, Quinn, um, you'll see, uh, you know, the. Um, this is a sample which is just showing sort of one thing at a time, and that's one model that you can use. But you may find, depending on how you like to take tests um, or how you like to structure them, um, that you want to see uh, relationships between styles. Um, so if we go back a little bit further in the stack, then we'll have something which shows um, a bunch of widths and a bunch of weights. And so um, that particular uh, test, let's see. There we go. So this is showing uh, diacritics. Is a question about diacritics. Um, yeah, this will do as well as, as as anything to show the range of weights. So here we have uh, narrow, regular, and wide, and we also have the different weights. And so they're stacked up in a short enough uh, sample that you can sort of fit everything on a page. Um, but um, yeah, you could compare weights of specific masters or instances that are generated for masters. But, but um, how, are, how are these tests, like what I'm looking at right now, how were these created um, in the first place? Oh, OK. Um, what I did to do this is there's a, we talked about this before, so I'll, I'll just uh, 
I'll reiterate. Um, there's a very small HTML snippet that I will build, and it will call uh, it will call out each of the styles that I want to use, um, and then I run it through a build uh, tool that Quinn made, and it makes the HTML to upload into uh, EQX. So it it takes a lot of the um, the possibility for error uh, out. I can do something relatively simple um, and quick in order to generate a test, or um, simple to mo um, to modify a test. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things that I found was really nice is I could just go search and replace, um, and I could go from like a string of O's to things that were uh, things that supported questions about diacritics or um, uh, other kinds of or, uh, questions about punctuation. All I have to do is is change the the test question and the little piece of uh, the little snippet of text that supports that question, and I can just make the, a new thing. And it takes about I don't know like maybe two minutes per question, something like that. Let me, um, so let to, me. just to answer, I think my understanding to you known as uh, the answer, just the basic answer is what you're looking there is basically the web font or the font that you've provided in the test, a particular version and HTML being rendered in the browser that you're using. Right. Yeah. So we, we would have to pre pre-render or we like if we want to create a test that's specific to a certain typeface let's say a number of instances that are not the same across typefaces we would have to uh, um, have a program generate the the tests basically specific to the typeface i mean you can make the piece of html that you want to use manually but quinn has made a tool that makes it very quick and easy uh, to do, I'm gonna try to get my text big enough on my screen so that it it's uh, easy to understand. Um, let I, I'll go ahead and present something just for a second. Eben, you're not sharing your screen. No, I'm not yet. Um, but I'm gonna try doing that now. So my my question of uh, or my problem understanding is uh, Font Bakery has been mentioned before, and in Font Bakery because it's code, it's Python itself. It can go into the font file and pull out information from the font file and then use that information for the tests, whereas um, EQX relies on, on tests that were made, um, that were prepared for it, right? So yes, it does. Yeah. You, you, you do need to ask, you need to make your own questions and you need to make your own samples. And if you need references to answer the question, you need to upload those as well. Uh, but, but, um, the, the comparison isn't entirely fair because Font Bakery is testing the technical qualities of the font and EQX is meant to replace the proofing process that font designers currently use, which is very piecemeal and um, doesn't retain any kind of um, project-based memory as you move through. So this is meant to add an efficiency to and the existing non-technical part of the design evaluation. Can I can I jump in here because I, I think we we're talking about one very specific way to generate visuals, and the reality is is it's much more flexible than that. Um, on right. your font yeah. uploads, I would, I would to like how maybe to give maybe some comment. I'm sorry, Viviana, what were you saying? In an open source environment, when you can have all sorts of users and questions. So maybe we are taking our experience on that type of process. Uh, and from that, we are jumping into these particular questions, not because we don't think the tool is uh, useful enough or something, but more because of that. And maybe one thing to consider will be which is the intended user for this tool and if it, that's going to be uh, an open source tool open to many of these questions that you could have in the future for any random for, uh, user. Right, I mean, we are trying to make a tool which is uh, very useful for uh, 
open source and, and you know Google kinds of projects, but is also really useful to small foundries if they want to use it. Um, we want to serve both uh, both groups of people or even other groups of people that we haven't thought of. We've tried to leave it as open as, as we can. Um, but Yanone, uh, the question that I understood you to be asking is sort of how do you make this stuff? Um, I'll, I mean, clarify. Sarah, I'll clarify that? my question. I'll okay. clarify it quickly. How yeah. do I make an overview of a single letter um, showing all the different weights of a typeface that's specific to the actual setup of the typeface, to the actual instances that are in the typeface, because they keep changing across fonts. I write a script. My understanding now is I write a script that's external to EQX that generates, for example, this uh, HTML code, and then I upload it somehow to EQX. Right. So if you're talking about, let's say, a variable font, then it has a, a series of axes, and it has a series of um, what are those things called anyway? Um, uh, designer indicated, you know, spots within the predefined the instances. Font. Predefined instances. Thank you. Um, so for the predefined instances, because you, you you know you, you aren't going to necessarily be able to to examine every one of the million spots, but if for the predefined instances you've got a set of values, you can go in and create shortcuts for each of those in the CSS to invoke each one of those, and then you can call each one of those up in order to show the width or the weight or the optical size or whatever the variable is that you're interested in testing. Because um, this tool is definitely oriented towards testing variable fonts, um, not uh, exclusively, but um, it's certainly that's, that's a big part of what it's meant to support. Um, but if you have static instances, you can also call those um, in a manner that's completely parallel, really. Um, the the actual the actual me the, the method is the same, but the the way that you would uh, call it would be slightly different. Kun can explain about that better than I can. Um, but if you if you if you um, if I stop sharing and we look at that example, um, we could actually try to think. Would it be helpful if I if I just give an overview of some of the different ways that you grab instances? Because there's a few different ones. So it doesn't oh, okay. have to be just from the EQX visual generator. OK. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so I'll start sharing again. So we were talking about grabbing instance data, right? Uh, when you upload a font, we're using font tools. We're extracting instances, uh, axes, pretty much everything, all the tables. Um, you know, this is all it gets displayed on the front end, but we retain all that info. That... Will you show them what it looks like if you add a static font? Yeah. Do I have a static font? That's the right one. Um, by Halyard. Let's grab bolt. Um, okay, lock open. It runs all of its checks on it, gets added. You can type in the weight. I guess nothing was, uh, I don't, I'm not sure. This must be pre release halyard. Um, normally these get filled automatically, but you can enter them manually. When you go, to the actual test creation, you can uh, you, you automatically get a few basic selectors pulled out into the side nav. Those basic selectors are the H1 through H6 tags, the list of items, paragraph tags, stuff like that. You can then use the sidebar in order to specify uh, what font you want to be displayed in those instances. You also have, like Evan was showing earlier, these predefined classes. Predefined is a little bit misleading in that it's not like EQX as a platform. 
has them predefined. It's more that the visual that you import then defines them. And then, then you can select each item. Uh, as you see here, you've got a bunch of classes, EQX CA1, EQX CA2. And so each of these have a built-in definition for what type of uh, font file at what different uh, variable access the, they want to display. It then searches for the closest acceptable uh, font uh, access definition, variable access definition to display with the font files that you have already imported, which is why we have this whole series. But you can always change that as well to something different. Um, so that is all contained within EQX itself, right? So if you were to go and scrape a website, and this will probably take a second to load, so my apologies. Mm -hmm. What the other thing about scraping websites is that even though it's really great that you can do it, if the web page itself is very, very complex, it can take a little while uh, to do. Um, but if it's a simple web page, then it will come in pretty quickly. It's because we're downloading all the assets associated with it. So it gets generated into an, uh, an HTML file that stays on the server, and that way it's not live. You know, If they change the website in a year, you'll still have that original file. But so we've generated, we've scraped this website. Oh, maybe I want to uh, set the H1 to a different font file. I can do that. I can manipulate it that way. And so this is all contained within EQX. What Evan was talking about moments earlier was this EQX generator, uh, visual generator where you uh, are creating the HTML documents, you're assigning classes to them. He had something open a moment ago that I'd like to just draw our attention to, which is how do you assign those classes? And it's just normal HTML. So if we go into visuals, let's uh, maybe we try the most basic one. Oh, and then here is his definition for what the default uh, variable access is that he is intending to display if the uh, font that's been uploaded to the project allows for it. All of these are defined separately. They're defined in the defaults.js, which is then pulled into the file on, uh, on Gulp, on Gulp build. And what that looks like is this. So you can change this to fit whatever access, uh, whatever uh, configuration your intended project, uh, your project is intending to target for whatever font uh, type, family, anything. So what th what this is is a map of all of those uh, pre-made uh, positions within the variable font uh, across all the axes, uh, axes for Meriwether, both the Roman and the Italic. And it allows me, with a very short uh, three, uh, three glyph code, to call up any of them. And so uh, Quinn came up with the system uh, for, for creating this gulp process and also the system for Meriwether, where they have a three-letter code that corresponds to a width, an optical size, and a weight. And if there was a different font, for example, that was added to this project that wasn't Meriwether, maybe we are testing for Meriwether, I don't know. Um, but it doesn't have widths. What we're doing on EQX's end is that we're using font tools to detect what the axes are. We are then going to search for as close as we can to the definition that's in defaults and display that instead. Oh, you mean if, if uh, somebody makes a test and it doesn't correspond to a pre-made instance? Yeah, like maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't use the word Meriwether. Let's say uh, uh, Peanut. Uh, maybe Peanut doesn't have a width and uh, 
weight axis. It's going to be able to detect that in EQX and then provide the closest match. Oh, okay. So you could it 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 it'll crash nicely in that way. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, what I would encourage you to do if you're testing your font is to go ahead and build you know one of these uh, sets of matrices so that you can test all of the spaces in your design space. So you know, if you've got ten axes, you know, maybe you have a ten letter code that corresponds to each of this, you know, each of the 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 kinds of axes, um, and uh, you know allows you to find the the different spots within that variable space um, in a quick easy way um, by making these kind of pre-made definitions and, you know you don't you don't have to do it this way but I think that if you do do it this way it'll save you a lot of time it saved me a lot of time and made building so, tests faster and easier um, and I've really appreciated having it so my understanding is that basically uh, I can make well, I can use some tool to build these definitions that are exact for my project, but also I could reuse something that might be already existing, and uh, EQX will well give me some lenience and 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 kind of you know re represent even if the, the 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 CSS snippet wasn't made specifically for my font, it will kind of try to to use it meaningfully, right? But but I, I definitely still would encourage you to adapt uh, what's here, and I mean you know the ideal thing in a way would have been to take one of David Berlow's fonts with you know uh, a phenomenal number of axes, um, because then you could pare it down from something even bigger. But I think that this is a relatively reasonable number of axes, you know, weight, width, and optical size. Um, plenty of of uh, designs just have two axes, um, and uh, the combination of upright and italic is also fairly common. Um, and I think, I forget, did we create something for small caps as well, where it invokes the small caps automatically? I forget if we did that or not. Um, if we didn't, we then we did. probably should. That, that might be like a thing to do. Oh, um, we built on. that into, so we used small caps as an open type feature. So oh, if, ins instead. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it, we just implement it generally. Um, because it's HTML, if the font that you're testing in has that open type feature. So it's just done in like normal CSS code instead of uh, looking up the tables. Right. So, um, but in theory, we could add it to to uh, to that thing if we want it as a definition. Just create a new a new digit for it. Okay. Cool. Uh, Yanone, did you was your question answered ultimately or not really? Yes, the the intelligence for creating uh, typeface specific visuals sits outside of EQX. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it took a bit to get it, to it, that. Yeah, it, it would, yeah, you're right. It it does exist outside of EQX. It would have to be in your brain, or in, <laughs> or it's, it's something which you uh, you write yourself. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like the, yeah. the code that generates tests that are specific to a typeface uh, is not part of EQX. Like we we take care of that. Yeah. Got right. it. But um, I can also, by the way, imagine, you know, um, I would, this is, of course, there are other libraries like JS libraries that allow you this kind of introspection. And there are these kind of specimen makers, you know, quite a few of them being developed. And I can Im imagine that this could be implemented in uh, some sort of way that, you know, that there would be, well, a, an HTML snippet that you're testing against or, or a scraped website that, that actually makes these stuff dynamically. So basically you're, you're somehow, you know, you're, you're using a different generator whether it's using Python and it's building these physical things, or maybe it's it's running the JS. Well, if I scrape a website, and that's kind of like a website, let's say, that has a variable font slider and the displayed, will that also show in the scraped version? So I think I'm going to have to be back in a minute. I'll, 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 I'll return as soon as I can. 
I, I guess think, it won't run JavaScript, right? It, it will run. It'll try to run JavaScript. <laughs> uh, you know, we we did we built a pretty rudimentary web scraper here, where we're trying to pull in as much that we can, save it to a single file so that it can be accessed at any time. But um, yeah, the project wasn't to build a sophisticated web scraper. So there, there, there are issues. <laughs> uh, right. OK, but, thanks. So. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it'll run some JavaScript. It won't run others. <laughs> Static websites are very friendly with it, though. So if you can find a static site generator, uh, it's probably going to be great. <laughs> so so um, if, if you want to compare two versions of the same font, you basically just set up your, your HTML to and your CSS to, to use the two different versions. Uh, yourself, or or is there a mechanism to to help with that? If 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 you need to do it several times or things like that. Yeah, if, if the idea is to maybe have a side by side, where on the left side it's this version of the font, the right side is that version of the font, then what would have to be done is in in the HTML document or as a SVG or however you want to create these things. We were playing with Figma exports into SVG, which was kind of fun, but um, you know, had its own series of issues that came along with it. You would then just create these two different things. Perhaps in the uh, defaults, you're specifying, hey, this is for this uh, class definition, this is for that class definition. And then you could have these two fonts displayed side by side with, you know, live rendering type. But you could also maybe export as a JPEG or some type of you know static image and display that to the right of it. Uh, it's, I think a lot of the answers to a lot of these questions is basically, can the web do it? If so, then we can do it. But there's probably more than one way. OK. I, I am a little bit concerned that uh, if this starts being adopted for, for instance, Type Foundry is commissioned by, by Google Fonts to work on Font Project, and um, uh, they start using this platform, then all of the uh, added value, all of these quality assurance procedures that are implemented that are project specific, uh, may end up in this kind of walled garden and not visible to the rest of the community. And as Google Fonts works with uh, only Libre licensed font, font projects, I would expect to have all of these more transparently available to whoever in the future may want to fork a project and continue working to be able to deploy the same initial set of tests that were implemented here. And I, I don't see an easy way to to make this more uh, more transparent, less of a walled garden. I, if I understand correctly, what you're asking for is um, some some type of way to guarantee that any test or any series of, of documentation that's created for these these projects or these tests are available to the community, right? Because they are they are in. I believe that they are they become an integral part of the project itself. Uh, yeah. The project is not only the glyphs file or the UFOs, but also the quality assurance procedures that were implemented specific to that project, right? I, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, I, I mean, my personal opinions around that. I, I'm going to like set to the side for a second. It, this is an open source tool. It's Libra. Um, as far as I understand, that licensing does not require anyone who uses it to also open source what they create. And However, the, the agreements for making the fonts with Google usually require that you show all of your work on Git. 
right? So there would be a way, I think there needs to be a way to incorporate this into that. Yeah, like it, maybe in in those commission projects, there could be a clarification that the testing documents that are created to be used with this tool should also be published alongside the typefaces. But I, I think it would be perhaps hazardous to build in some type of feature to this platform that forces uh, users of it to publish everything they create. Because sure, because yeah. the, the tool can, can also be used for proprietary fonts or, or fonts under NDAs. And so, yeah, for sure, you, you should not uh, make it mandatory, but I think it would be useful to have the feature to, to make it easier to integrate into like keeping track of what was created. And uh, may, maybe the file format that you use for exporting is enough, but I don't know if it includes everything or just or just the templates or yes it, it should well it it should include can you deploy it completely based on just the files that is the intention um you know is that working incredibly smoothly right now not yet but then but but, but will it include also the the answers that people made or or just the questions well, I, I think we need to have two options, right? Okay. One that strips out all the answers and one that only that includes the answers in case mm -hmm. you wanted to use it through your own system. Um, okay. The final format that you export uh, of a project or of a test is different than the, the JSON document that you grab at your test results page. Mm -hmm. Because the export of the test or the project will come as a zip file that also has all the different HTML documents because even for the web scrapers, you know, we're, we're generating a static file that then we serve. So anything that's displayed on the platform as a question is attached to a static file and therefore can be attached into a zip file so that you can import it on another platform or just document it on GitHub. Okay. Sounds good. But, and I think just about everybody's going to care about saving the test results um, because it's part of tracking your work. So that even for proprietary projects, like we're, you know, we're doing that on Git for our own internal stuff. No, we couldn't hear you, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> so I think soon we're planning to release a beta of this that we're hoping will encourage people to use the platform and start creating tests. Um, you know, we don't have a release right now on the public repo. We don't have a, a very clear roadmap for future development. But these are things that we've been keeping track during development and we'll probably publish alongside it when we do do that uh, release. And then once that happens, uh, I think I think we're gonna hope that people will also help us with development. Um, you know, we've discussed creating like a almost plug-in system for uh, adding tests live. We've also discussed a more sophisticated editor for the visual creation within the platform. Um, there's there's a lot we want to do with this thing. And we think that a lot of these features give a lot of power. Um, and even that GitHub, uh, attaching this, this program to GitHub repo and saying where the uh, files that we should be accessing um, are would be very helpful. Maybe some auto uh, versioning for every time that a GitHub repo gets updated, creates a new test, a new version of the test, and we can see and track progress as we go. So I hope when we do release it, you guys get to play around with it a little bit, <laughs> or at least are, are encouraged to. <laughs> I wanted to say that um, I think it's sensible to kind of limit the scope, as in, you know, there are 
let's say for what Felipe was saying, you know, about this, say, sharing and everything of tests. I don't think, you know, I mean, at some point maybe, but I think it would be sensible to first think about this good export functionality and maybe, you know, somebody else like Google Fonts, like has the font bakery, could then create a repo where these archives could be uh, could be placed. But this, this, of course, it it, it all um, well. I mean, as as long as um, you know, it's it's libre or li licensed properly, the content uh, that's like the only you know concern that might be raised. That uh, let's say if, but that's again, that's not part of the tool. That's part of uh, how you make projects that, for instance, you know, a test writer or test author would only use materials, these reference materials like scraped websites or etc. that are that allow uh, uh, republishing. And then, you know, you get this archive of um, the tests without the answers, um, put it into the repo and somebody else can import it for a different project i think that's that's sem sensible but i i don't think you should be you know you should try to make this into like a uh you know template figma style where there's a whole community website and you can i think it's 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 better to to have a file format um you know, interaction. So basically I can serialize this to some file and then maybe, you know, prune it manually, unzip, prune it manually, edit something, and then package it back for, for like reuse and publish it on some repo uh, that, that ho holds those uh, test templates or project templates as it were. Yeah, I, I agree. And it seems like in the in the font community, that is the most successful way um, modularizing these different uh, tools so that they can be used in any platform. People can interact with them in any way that they feel most comfortable. And then, you know, spin off uh, plugins is the wrong word, but spin off tools that help support it. The other thing too is that. You know, as we were talking about potentially doing this, like when in the conceptual stages of this, one of the things that came up quite early is that nobody's really uh, capable of writing all of the tests. You know, the expertise where fonts and scripts and so on are concerned is is fairly distributed, and um, you know, your your interests both in terms of uh, style uh, that a font is made in, and also in terms of script support. Um, is is going to be a distributed thing. And so you'd want to assemble a team that would ask questions that are relevant to your project. Um, so even though you could make things that are, you know, reusable, like I was talking about with Felipe earlier in the in the call, um, the, the importance is, um, and especially like for something like Noto, would be to uh, not pretend like you know what the answers are, but instead find your experts, you know, trust them, get them to write the questions. And you know, get a really uh, solid um, set of questions for your particular project. You know, do the tailoring. Um, you know, make it right in that way. And and so we've left things open with EQX with with that model in mind. And just a quick clarification: I can, when I go through answer the tests, I can leave questions unanswered. Right? I don't have to answer yes or no to every. That's correct. Yeah, you if, okay. if you if you feel like I don't know what the answer is to this, you can definitely just go on to the next question. Um, I mean, there, actually, I hadn't thought of this before, and um, this might even be scope creep, but um, it would be maybe interesting to put in like an "I don't know" button as opposed to just passing. Um, I don't I don't know how awful an idea that is, um, or how useful an idea. Well, I don't is. know is no. I don't know is no, and then you leave a note saying, "I don't know. I actually don't know because you know there's this or that that I'm missing." Yeah. Well, I think this is it. It's maybe worth discussing a little more. Um, well, the only, I mean, the advantage of saying this "I don't know" is meaning you know if you if 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 there is 
well, no can kind of, people may think that there's something wrong because some percentage is not completed. Um, having an I don't know or an active I don't know means that you basically your response has been recorded. So the the questions that you haven't answered yet or haven't addressed, looked at it yet, are have a different status than the ones that you have. So I could, for instance, you know, go through 20 questions and answer I don't know to each one of them. But my task is done because I've been asked to, you know, to 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 uh, to solve this this puzzle. And somebody else says, no, I haven't yet gotten time to solving this puzzle. So my questions are still completely unanswered. But this is, you know, I'm not saying please do it. It's just something worth thinking about. It's purely from a project manager manager perspective. You know, yeah. it might be useful to see whether somebody has addressed these questions or not. And sure. all, all the answers that include an I don't know from one of the team members could be reviewed by whoever made the test to be sure that the question is clear. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it, right now there are three ways to answer a question, right? It looks like there's only two, but there's three. Uh, you've got yes, you've got no, and you've got next question. Um, I think what we're discussing is, should there be a distinction between next question and uh, I don't know next question? Um, I think that's something that we probably will have to do some testing around. Uh, one of the things that we've been very careful of in the development of EQX is not adding in uh, too many possible responses that distract from the clarification of you know, a pass-fail system. And I could see issues with that, but we'll look into it more. And you know, maybe there's a, a smooth way where it, it's simple it is, as simple as it is in order to hit the next question, it is to hit, I don't know, next question. Oh, Quinn, we we um we do have the ability, right, that a person can leave a note even when they're not saying no, but the, it's it's hard. You have to like go fish for it, right? So you could theoretically right now without like just sort of as a a bit of a hack, you could before you skip, you could say you could just type in, I don't know, or skipped on into, on purpose or something like that. Because I think the problem with having the skip button and not having an I don't know button is that as the project manager, when you're looking at the test results, you don't know if it was skipped on purpose or not. Mm, yeah, good point. So um, am I right that right now you could add a note, it, it, there's friction, but you could? No, right now we are, oh, okay. we are only allowing people to add comments if they have said no, okay. uh, in order to okay. remove ambiguity. But yeah, you know, there might be, it, it, I could see a scenario where instead of uh, creating a response of, I don't know, you then have sort of a modal or some type of uh, interaction that confirms that you're purposely skipping this question. Um, I think what, we probably want to do is identify, you know, what are these scenarios where we might want that I to know and, and see if there's a better solution for them um, before we start adding in uh, ambigu ambiguity. Well, this is the thing that like having user actual, you, you know, users using the tool is going to help us to clarify this. We intentionally tried to stay away from building out this kind of functionality now before we we saw how, how users interact with it. I think the typical uh, scenario for kind of skipping temporarily versus sp skipping permanently is that, you know, you could skip temporarily because you need to do some more research on the question. You know, maybe the question is, is oh, I need to sort of consult with somebody, send a screenshot and, you know, get a second opinion, whatever. But then you want to proceed with, with uh, the other questions of, of, of the whole thing, answer, you know, everything quickly as much as possible, and then maybe come back to, to the ones that 
for you as the answering question are still outstanding. So you kind of skip it temporarily, you know, later, I'll answer it later, versus a real ignore this question right. for me. Yeah, so and, that's and two different. And, and maybe that, maybe that there, I, I see that there are probably a, a, a range of solutions for all of these problems. Um, my my uh, initial reaction would be, hey, if you missed a question, maybe on accident, or maybe you've skipped over a series of five questions on your test, on the test results page, it should have something that displays, hey, you skipped these five questions. Please revisit them if you have time. Um, or, or some type of check at the end of the process that allows you to be purposeful or to guarantee that you're being purposeful. But I, I, I think, I think like Joyce was saying, that we probably need to get um, a little bit more data for how people actually want to interact with this platform. Since we are proposing uh, a solution to what is usually a pretty open-ended QA process and proposing a more uh, target-driven one. But I, I think uh, Adam's comment, the thing that it, it reminds me of is that um, EQX has made it with sort of uh, significantly a idealistic idea about what the process should be like or sort of seeking an ideal process. And in doing that, I mean, I think that's a good thing in a way, um, but various realities will intrude and um, people will make tests which are incomplete or ambiguous in various ways or where, you know, the the references aren't supplied, even though they could be. Um, and so, yeah, there, 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 there may be scenarios where, you know, when the rubber hits the road there, we need to, to do a little something extra. Yeah. When, when it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if there are impossible to answer questions uh, for yes or no. <laughs> Obviously, our understanding of what is needed for all uh, type family QA processes is limited. <laughs> so it will, I guess it'll reveal itself in due time. <laughs> but I, I do like the, the, the yes and no, and I think, you know, the, the, there will be some writers who will formulate, uh, like tutor people on, on writing good questions because it's not obvious, like, you know, like, if, uh, well, I, I just laughed because a, a few minutes ago, Dave, on the chat, ask, ask something like, uh, you couldn't hear me, right? And that's a question <laughs> that you don't know how to answer with a yes or a no. <laughs> so that's why I answered, we couldn't hear you, uh, or something like that, because that's like a, so, so yeah, so for, of course, for this type of, you know, things like, uh, doesn't it look wrong to you? Uh, if somebody right. posts this question, it's like, uh, <laughs> what's how? So you know, but that's of course not part of the tool. That's part of the, the uh, uh, um, kind of tutorials or something which I think you know people uh, will create. And this is this is sort of like a different responsibility, but but I think uh, would happen. Yeah, the other thing you can imagine generating a lot of I don't knows is a, a a test that is too broad. So, like for instance, imagine you're adding three scripts to a font, but rather than making individual targeted tests for Cyrillic, Greek, and Hebrew, you did like a language additions test. And so then the people who were taking the test, who were taking it because they're Hebrew experts, can't answer for the Cyrillic and the Greek. Well, that test needs to be carved up more. And and that so there's there will be some sort of a learning curve on that because I when I know that when new users first start using the tool, they're not going to realize that kind of thing immediately. Yeah, I think there's a lot of. Um... So a lot of baked in opinions with EQX that push test creators to create more modular, specific, um, and perhaps shorter but plentiful amounts of tests. 
so that they can be a little bit more digestible and targeted, um, which uh, might might will, will probably require some type of training and, and some type of uh, community moderation, be, uh, maintaining and bettering the tests that are created and reused on this platform. But the great thing about that is we're going to have community moderation around having ideal tests and the actual test quality material is going to benefit from that. Also, by making things explicit, there's a lot of room to say, oh, that's what you meant by that and have disagreements or conversations about you know, uh, what something should look like for a given project. Um, so, I mean, I think that um, even though it could uh, raise some dust, it was probably ultimately a positive pro uh, process to make things explicit. Um, the the meeting has been, um, I really enjoyed it, but um, I'm wondering, did, does anybody not get what they wanted to get out of the meeting? Um, Okay, cool. Because um, I know that people are starting to say, "Okay, I have to go," <laughs> but I wanted I, I wanted to make sure that we we uh, we covered issues. But the other thing too is that we're very happy to to hear from you guys if you have questions and you're you know if you're uh, chewing into this thing. Um, I'm sure that there'll be bugs here and there, but also um, conversations to have. Um, and so, yeah, I'll look forward to having those conversations with you later, and I, I imagine Quinwell as well. Cool. Just a very it, brief yeah, thanks question. very much. Uh, will each each question have like a unique URL if it's published on a on a running server, so people can just you know, uh, or well, I mean, maybe no. Let's forget it. I'll I'll ask some other channel. I'm just thinking well, of I, scenarios I can, I can where you know quickly. people want to point. <laughs> each question, like basically, the URL structure for these questions are wherever your EQX is being hosted, followed by the test ID, followed by the question ID, or not question ID, question number. So yes, each okay. question has a unique URL, but you still need to have you know permission to access it. <laughs> yep, sure. It's just like, you know, if, if there is a team and somebody says, oh, I've updated the question, I've added something, please take a look again or something that it's easy to uh, to use URLs, I I always hate it if it's sort of convoluted, especially with mobile apps where you can't just I want the URL to this and I want to email it to somebody. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. So you want to be able to to uh, dig in more um, more directly. We'll have to talk. We'll have to talk to Quinn about that. Um, Dave, did you have anything else? Uh, hey everyone. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I, actually, I'm, I'm already glad to go to the other meeting. So this has been great. Um, I'll, I'll circle back with Denny about how we could use in the data project, um, and Adam um, might be able to help uh, advocate as well. Cool. So I'll stop the recording. And uh, thanks everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.